Hey, um, can people hear me? Yes. All right, uh, so it's 10. I'm going to get started. Um, yeah, uh, so my name is Sarah Hartsey. Um, I work at Delphix on the systems platform team. Um, I've been working on CFS um, as well as some other stuff. Um, today I'm going to talk about an optimization for CFS and it's my contact info if you want to reach out. Um, slide transitions. That's disturbing. Um, Dan, do you know about slide transitions? Should be able to use my keyboard, right? Yeah, you should. All right. I think there's a focus thing. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going to give a little uh, ZFS background. Um, it's a pretty small group, so I'm assuming that if you're here, you have like some passing familiarity uh, with ZFS. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, basically the problem we're running against, which is how clone deletion works right now. Then I'm going to talk about this new algorithm, um, talk about some tweaks we made to the algorithm in terms of scalability, and then I'll talk about uh, the performance gains we saw. So uh, some quick definitions. Um, we have data. Uh, they're in these tree things. Um, data blocks on the bottom. Uh, we have lock pointers that reference that tell you where to actually find your data on disk. And everything is in a tree. And you can have a kind of arbitrary number of these indirect blocks. And that's how the tree grows. A snapshot is an immutable copy of a data set at a certain point in time. So you want to like pin this data set in time, uh, you make a snapshot, and then to get a mutable copy of the snapshot, you can take a clone. So copy on write means that creating a clone is as simple as getting the pointer to the root of the snapshot. Um, so creating clones, super fast. Uh, what about modifying clones? Um, again, uh, copy on write. So when you modify a clone, you change one of these blocks. You have to propagate the change up the tree. Uh, it needs a new indirect block. And the indirect block that points to that needs a new indirect block, and so on. And so out the course of the clone's lifetime, you find that it diverges from the snapshot. There are blocks that are still shared with the snapshot, like the blue ones. And then there are ones that are clone only, the green ones. Um, so when we delete the clone, we want to make sure that we're determining which blocks are still associated with the snapshot and which blocks are unique to the clone. So we want to be able to delete the clone without doing anything to the snapshot. Um, so the basic algor algorithm for this is to iterate over the on disk tree and basically uh, cut off branches of the tree based on birth time. Um, if an indirect block was born before the clone was created, you're sure that it doesn't belong to the clone, so you can just ignore everything under it. Um, but what you want to find is these green blocks, the ones that belong to the clone, and to delete them. Um, so I'm going to talk about basically two different uh, patterns of writes that have like very different uh, performance behaviors. So the case where this algorithm works best is when you have a bunch of contiguous writes. And the contiguous writes all get covered by just a couple indirect blocks. So if all of these writes are really close to each other, the number of clone-specific blocks is relatively small. Um, however, if you have sparse writes, um, which again can just be a couple writes if they're all over uh, your tree, then all of these indirect blocks um, are suddenly fair game for checking in the algorithm. So here we could um, cut off huge chunks of this tree. It was pretty easy to find what we needed to delete. Here we have to go and check everything, and we only end up freeing like four blocks. Um, so this proportion of number of indirect blocks visited to number of blocks you actually end up freeing um, is where this inefficiency comes in. Um, so at Delphix, we have a pretty specific usage pattern um, where we have really small block sizes. And because we're representing databases, there are lots of little sparse updates. Um, so we saw some like fairly disturbing performance characteristics. Uh, so the light purple is sparse writes. And the dark purple, which you can barely see, is contiguous writes. And so this is the time to delete snapshots um, of those sizes. Um, 
with, uh, they, they both have the same amount written to them, which is roughly like one, uh, one block per indirect block. Um, but if the writes are scattered, uh, it can take a really, really, really long time to delete them. Um, think like 45 minutes to delete terabyte or so. Um, and yeah, that has a lot of like unfortunate consequences uh, throughout the system. Like you're trying to, you delete something giant, you want to be able to use the memory that it has theoretically freed up, but it's gone. Um, you're creating new clones faster than you can delete them, things like that. Um, so this can get pretty severe and we're gonna look at trying to fix it. Um, so the basic idea behind this algorithm is instead of traversing this tree every time, or at delete, once at deletion, we're going to instead uh, store the uh, writes and deletes as they occur. So we're going to have some kind of data structure and we're just going to put our block pointers, references to the block pointers in that. And then at the end, when we're ready to delete, the work will be proportional to the actual number of writes we've done to the clone, as opposed to the size of the snapshot. Um, so if we've only written a couple things to the clone, they happen to be scattered all over the place, deletion time should be way faster. Um, so here are a few more details about this algorithm. Um, so one key idea is that we need to keep track of blocks that are both allocated and freed on the clone. The reason for this is imagine you have a file on your clone and you write to it, and then you, you append an alloc to your live list, like, oh, I, I have this, it's part of the clone now. If you go and overwrite that file on the clone, um, because of copy on write, you're going to be freeing that uh, original block pointer and replacing it with a new one. So you want to make sure that you, you keep track of when you free things so that at the end, when we go back and delete things, we don't double free. Um, and so uh, these arrows match up pairs of uh, alloc, alloc and free pairs, and the red circles are the block pointers uh, that were alloced but never freed, and those are the ones that are like alive. Uh, so when we delete them, when, or when it's time to delete the clone, we know those are the ones we have to delete. Um, so the, now I'll step through the algorithm, uh, which is how we figure out what we're going to delete. Um, so basically, we'll go backwards through the live list. Um, we'll insert the free block pointers into an AVL tree. Um, and then we will check uh, the presence of the alloc block pointer in that AVL tree. So uh, alloc number five was not in the block tree. Um, we know that if it was ever freed, the free block pointer would be like after it in the list, which is why we're going backwards. Um, so we know we can put it on this list of, okay, these are the things we're gonna free for real. Um, and so now four, four is in the AVL tree. We know we don't have to free it. Um, we can delete them both, ignore them both. Um, insert a free, insert a free. Uh, check for the presence of three. It's in there, we can ignore them. A two is not in the AVL tree. We know we'll have to free it for real. And A one is present. And so now we, those are the two, that, that is the actual work we have to do to delete the clone. Like those are the actual like changes we're going to make. Um, so where are we now? Um, we now have deletion work that is proportional to the number of writes to the clone as opposed to the size of the snapshot, which is awesome. Um, we also have a relatively low um, overhead, like this is just a list that we are inserting onto the end of. Um, so the IO from that cost isn't very high. Um, a downside is that the live list can go arbitrarily large. Um, imagine if you have a clone and you overwrite it once and then you overwrite it again and you overwrite it again and again and again and it will just grow infinitely large. Um, and this is pretty bad when we want to actually go and delete it. Um, because it can grow arbitrarily large, we can, it would be arbitrarily costly to load it into memory. Um, and also uh, ZFS has a pattern of incremental destroy for a lot of its data structures, which is basically like instead of um, deleting this all at once, you kind of like space out the work. Um, it's a little unclear how that pattern would work on a single live list because um, the matching of freeze and Alex, uh, they can appear anywhere in the list relative to each other. So you can't really uh, make any decisions about what to do unless you know uh, the contents of the whole list. 
Um, so the next improvement is instead of one giant list, we're going to have uh, many smaller sublists. Um, we're going to delete them one at a time, um, hopefully. And the way uh, we're going to ensure that we're able to delete them one at a time is that if an alloc has a matching free, then it should end up in the same list. Um, and we also um, now can ask questions like, how big is it reasonable for one of these data structures to be um, to load into memory? And we basically picked a value that's like, it wouldn't be crazy to uh, load that into memory in one transaction group, so like some small fraction of RAM. Um, so here's a little more detail. Um, the way that we succeed in, in making sure freeze and alex of the same block pointer end up in the same sublist is by uh, sorting them by birth time. Um, so an alloc and a free, they, they're really just like metadata for like one block pointer, and so they have like, you, you can tell they're the same because they point to the same place in memory, and then you can tell that they're from the same like transaction group. Um, transaction group is, it's not like super important, um, but it's, you can think of it as a way of like ordering events, and so um, multiple things can happen in one transaction group. Um, and then we can store, because we have this ordering of transaction groups, we can store all of these sublists into an AVL tree so that um, insertion is relatively easy. Um, and now we have these sublists and we can destroy them incrementally. Um, does anyone have any questions up until this point? Cool. Yeah. If you let your snapshot or clone persist, Mm -hmm. Won't even this potentially grow to an unreasonably large size? Yeah, for sure. Um, we're going to talk about that in a bit. But yeah, it's still, this hasn't solved the problem of what if we just keep overwriting the clone? Um, cool. Um, yeah, so n now um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of, of incremental and asynchronous destroy. So um, sync in context. Um, blocks I.O. Like, things have to get out to disk. So if you're in syncing context, you're holding up writes. Um, and then open context, you're not holding up I.O. Things can kind of happen all around you. We want to limit the amount of work we do per sync as not to block I.O. Um, so as we said before, we only want to destroy one sublist because we can roughly manage its size. Um, and then we can also separate the work that needs to go into deletion um, between things that have to actually happen, like actually have to propagate stuff to disk, versus things that can happen in the background. Um, so example, changing on disk metadata, uh, like keeping track of the live list, live list, whether or not it exists or not, and then actually deleting the block pointers, that all has to happen in syncing context. But the bulk of the like really costly work that we have to do is loading um, the sublist into memory, and that we can do anytime, basically. Like, and then we can also do the part of the algorithm where we like iterate over and find what block pointers we need to do. That can also happen whenever. Um, so being able to kind of like separate those two parts of deletion um, also is like an important uh, performance factor. Okay, cool. So we've made some improvements. We've limited how much memory is loaded at once, and we've also have a pretty reasonable. Um, deletion strategy for incremental destroy. Um, cons, as was mentioned, um, the number of sublists is still unbounded. Um, this has two main side effects. One is just disk space. We're just like using up more space um, than we might want to. And the other is that the more sublists we have, the more costly insertion is. So the reason for this is that when we just had a single sublist, all the writes just could go in the end of it. Um, we didn't really care about ordering. The uh, alloc free ordering of like how time works um, gave us all the ordering we needed. Um, but now we need to make sure that um, a block pointer goes in its correct um, sublist. So this isn't a huge issue for the alex because we just kind of um, add more sublists on demand and just stick the alex on the end. Um, but the freeze could go to any sublist. Um, so with multiple sublists, it's possible that we append to a bunch of sublists, and each sublist could be a different block, um, and each write could write to many different blocks, which is bad. 
Um, so the worst case I.O. scenario would be a single transaction group has rights that append to a bunch of different sublists and therefore a bunch of different blocks. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Cool. Um, so we did a little analysis of this. Um, so here's a graph. The purple is just no sublists. Uh, this is just like the original algorithm or like the, the way things were before I touched it. Um, the dark pink is like the first iteration of this algorithm, which is just the single sublist or the single live list. Um, so everything was going to one block. And then the light pink is an example, um, kind of manufactured example, but where we have 50 different sublists and um, we were freeing and appending things to all 50 of them uh, per write. So it got worse and that's, that's a bummer. Um, because we're trying to like improve deletion, but here we are accidentally making uh, writes worse, and it kind of like makes sense. We're we're doing this this bookkeeping, and we're doing this extra work as we go to kind of like make our lives easier at the end. And there's a cost to that, um, and so we're going to look at, at mitigating this cost a little. But like this work has to happen somewhere. Um, yeah, conservation of energy or whatever. Uh, but condensing sublists. So the next concept is basically when we store an alloc and a free pair, we're basically storing a no-op. Like I've alloc this block pointer, it's been freed. Um, I don't care about it anymore. If it could just be gone from this, this live list, that would be great. So the idea of this is we have this algorithm, which is the same algorithm we use for deletion. Um, can't we just kind of run this periodically to like clean up stuff so we're not keeping track of too many um, pieces of information that we don't have to? Um, so I think if this figure makes sense, you have uh, alloc of one, free of one, you see they cancel each other out, and then you just like get rid of them and you output this new live list, which is just the things that were never freed. Um, so that uh, decreases like the total amount of space used. But we still have the problem of we have a bunch of these sublists, still have to append to a bunch of blocks. And the next uh, step for that is to uh, merge sublists. So the sublist got smaller once we condensed it. Um, and if one next to it was also condensed and got smaller, then we can just merge those two together. And now we've reduced the overall number of sublists. Um, yeah. So this algorithm, as you might have noticed, is pretty similar to the way deletion works. Um, so I've applied a, a similar kind of like, you have a thread that does some stuff in syncing context, and you have one that does some in open context, and the stuff in syncing context is like the actual like merging the two lists together and putting them back on disk. And the open context stuff is opening up the, the live lists and then iterating over. And things get a little more complicated. Um, the nice thing about deletion and this like threading system was that once you've deleted a um, a clone, you've basically like promised you're never going to try and write to it again, and you're not going to import it or export it or remove its device or like all these things. Um, but for condensing, like these are all things that could happen while you're condensing it. Um, so things get a little weird in there, um, and we had to be careful. And so that, that was a little more complicated, but it works, pretty sure. So here's where we are now. Um, we've made the work of deleting a clone proportional to the number of writes to that clone using this live list idea. Um, this is great. This was our original goal. Um, we've also kind of cleaned up the notion of the live list. Uh, we've limited the memory that we're using in one go using these sublists, which also um, make it easier to delete the thing incrementally and asynchronously. And we've also slowed the growth of all of these numbers of sub sublists by periodically condensing and then merging back together the sublists. Um, yeah? So that basically amortizes the cost of managing the sublists based on when you're doing additional writes in your uh, Hopefully. I mean, that's, that's the idea. Uh, <laughs> Like there's there are costs associated with doing the condensing itself and the merging itself, um, and the hope is that that offsets the 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 cost of of rights and stuff. Um, in practice, we can make live lists like or sub lists really big um, because like we have a lot of RAM, and so 
probably, unless you have really, really big clones, you're not going to be using a bunch of sublists. But this, like, I, I made like artificially small sublists to test this out um, and kind of test the scale. Yeah? Are the sublists fixed or, or variable size? Um, so this is kind of interesting. Um, we have this property that we want all of the alloc free pairs to end up in the same sublist. Um, so you don't want to like impose a hard cutoff where it's like no more no more entries because maybe something will suddenly get freed and it'll have to go in there. So the way that we do it, and then the other the other thing the other thing is we want to make sure that no, I just touched my mic uh, that all the different um, writes and frees from the same transaction group end up in the same sublist, and we don't know like from our, on the top of our heads how many writes are going to occur in a given transaction group. So they, in practice, end up being variably sized. They're kind of like flexible. Um, you start off like, all right, here's everything for transaction group one. Um, you take all the rights from transaction group one. Um, you check if there's, if it's under our like limit. If it's under the limit, then you're like, oh sure, whatever. Anything from transaction group two can come in here too. But it's over the limit, you're like, no more. You make a new sublist, but you still allow things to be freed to it. Um, so it's it's more of like a suggestion than a fixed limit. So a sublist could, broadly speaking, grow to twice the target size in the worst case scenario. Yeah, um, plus some extra weirdness uh, if you manage to like do a ton of writes in one TXG. Do you remember what that size was? Yeah, it's like half a million, a million block pointers. Yeah, something like that. Cool. Um, yeah. Could you describe a few workflows where you're indeed handling lots and lots of clones? Um, lots and lots of clones. If you mentioned like thousands or you know, what, what or like re this really like? really big clones. Or, or yeah, big clones. that's that's the main thing. So, so not yeah. Okay. So so this doesn't help you if you have a ton of clones. Okay. Uh, I mean, I guess it does because they're they all like cost less to to destroy. But like, if you if you make a snapshot of like something really large, then you sparsely update that. So for our example, we have um, like virtual databases, and they're really big, and um, the databases are sparsely updated because like databases, um, and so. When um, you go to delete it, it's like, oh well, this this clone claims that it's only like a gig, uh, even though like the underlying snapshot maybe is like a terabyte because you've only made a few changes to it. Um, and then when you go to delete it, it takes 45 minutes, and then you're sad. Yeah. So we actually had this problem like with a real customer use case where you know uh, they had some database, some giant database. It's like you know 10 or whatever, and we said, and uh, they wanted to be able to take, uh, like have every 15 minutes, create a clone of that, um, so that they have it ready in case somebody wants, uh, you know, wants data from that point in time, and they want to keep, you know, a, to date a week's worth of those 15 minute wow. clones, which is like, it's a bunch of clones, but not that, it's like, you know, a thousand or whatever, which is fine. But yeah, in theory, clones are cheap. It's yeah, really right. fast so to make them. Well. <laughs> You're tempted to make a ton of them because you can do it. Yeah, Instantly. Like we, did, we did the math, and it's like, great, so you, know, you have 10 terabyte database, each clone, you're going to make minimal changes, so you need like you know, 12 terabytes of storage. And so they've written 12 terabytes of storage, everything's great, um, until like two weeks later w when uh, we find that like the, you know, they have the right number of snapshots, they've written every clones, just like we expected. Those are using the amount of space that we expected, but the pool's out of space. There's no more space left in the pool. And the reason is that like all those things that they had deleted are being background are like queued up to be background still deleted, but like we yeah. can create like you can create these new clones and do the writes super fast because <coughs> like you create the clone off of the most recent snapshot which is cached in memory. Sure. And then you do some writes which are just you know find some space on disk and write them. But to delete old stuff we have to go read all these indirect blocks. So it takes like more than fifteen minutes to delete every clone and so you just and get you, behind for I don't even need to delete every fifteen minutes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, you think they're falling off the deposition time and then <coughs> it's deleted, so you're just <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's basically like we're, we're dirtying, dirtying our metadata and we have to, yeah, it's costly. Um, yeah. Sorry, what was the last part? Space map condensing. Oh, space map condensing? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's similar. Yeah. It's, it's similar in concept, for sure. Um, and there's a similar idea of condensing space maps, so we use the same term there. But um, the implementation is totally different because space maps are recording like ranges. So space, like in entering the space map, says, this range was like from offset x length y was allocated. Yeah. yeah. Versus here, it's like an entry says one block was allocated, and then we'll see that exact same block later that was free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another um, kind of point of similarity to this this algorithm is the way that we handle uh, dead lists for snapshots. Um, we're basically like reusing those data structures. Um, and they have, they went through a similar path of, oh, what if we have this one big list? Oh, wait, how about we actually have some smaller lists? Um, and so that was, that was cool to reuse. But they're kind of uh, different, different performance concerns um, because uh, with a snapshot, you're try basically trying to keep track of the blocks that like belong to only one snapshot. And um, that, that uh, performance scale has to do with like how many snapshots you have. Um, yeah. How badly does it mess this up if you take snapshots of six months? Um, like the performance or the algorithm? Well, I guess the live list will have trees that aren't free. Um, so once you take a snapshot of the clone, you, you just turn off the live list because snapshots don't have live lists. And then if you take a clone of that snapshot, then we start, start fresh. Yeah, so that the kind of isolation to just caring about the clone is, is really useful for this. Um, so I have some figures. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I'm all trying to uh, calculate what losses could be from extra metadata. It seems like uh, this double or even triple amount of direct loss uh, in a pool, uh, so triple amount of metadata stored. Yeah, sure, the sequentially it's easy to read, mm -hmm. but just the amount of metadata growing even more. And uh, in it also increases the amount of memory consumed, partially it's fixed by some lists, but then again, if we have 50 sub lists and doing random access for those different files, and uh, we may, which were updated at different times, we update all those whatever, 50 different sub lists. Uh, so it means we have to write an additional 50 blocks, mm -hmm. uh, concatenate them. Uh, if they are weak, it may be sequential uh, right over here. So some SSD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's. I'll get into that a little bit more later. But like this, this feature is definitely not ideal for for all workloads. Um, but yeah, just like a refresher, I'm going to talk about uh, the difference in performance between sparse and contiguous writes. This is just fix this in your mind. 
Um, so uh, here's a workload of uh, sparsely written clones. So the, the purple is the old algorithm. The pink is the new. Um, it's better, uh, which is good. Uh, in this particular workload, so, so this varies a fair amount um, depending on things like block size. So this is a 16K block size, which is actually bigger than what we use at Delphix. We use an 8K block size typically. Um, and the more you can kind of imagine, like the more the smaller your block size is, the more blocks you have. The more blocks you have, the more indirect blocks you have, and then the the more amplified the the effects of the scattered writes are. Um, so like if you make this, yeah. So this works really well for for small block sizes, um, and you can actually see in this particular workload that the the performance of the old um, algorithm is like right there in terms of linear to the size of the snapshot, um, almost unnaturally so. Um, and then here's a comparison of the performance time for deleting with the new algorithm to the size of the clone. Um, and by clone size, I mean like clone only space. Um, so that was like pretty satisfying to see that because like that's, this was our goal. This was our goal was to get deletion time um, for the clone to actually be proportional to the size of the clone. And that is, is pretty satisfying. Um, this is some performance of um, contiguously written clones. So we can see that the old algorithm in this particular workload actually does a bit better. Um, turns out, like, when you have these nice, densely written, contiguously written things, um, the old alg algorithm is actually pretty good at, doing, at deleting them. Um, but this was kind of encouraging that, like, we didn't incur like massive overheads um, with our new algorithm, and that it handled it relatively well. Yeah. How are you capturing this data? Uh, no, I'm just using. Um, so, it's a little weird because you have to account for the time that is spent, um, like in the background, like indirectly freeing. So I'm I'm like using FIO and then. Uh, just running a delete command and then also waiting for the freeing property to go away and just using like system timer thing. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this kind of uh, leads me to the point of like, yeah, sometimes we don't actually want live lists. Um, sometimes the performance gain like is non-existent um, and we can approximate the performance gain for deletion based on the percentage of blocks shared by the clone and its origin snapshot. Basically, as um, this clone size like gets closer to the snapshot size, we know that the, the two trees have diverged sufficiently um, that like, it, it doesn't actually matter. Like, it's, it's not helpful. Every, every read of an indirect block that we do will be sufficient. Um, and we can just turn that off. Um, so yeah, 0% shared means that the clone has completely diverged. Um, and live lists are only really giving us gains for sparse writes. And once a certain percentage is overwritten, there's like mathematically, mathematically is unable for the writes to be sparse anymore. Um, so we have a threshold right now of about 75%. Um, 75%, yeah, once. <laughs> 75% or less is shared, then we turn off the sublists. Cool. Yeah? What's the CPU impact of this? Intuitively, it sounds like this is going to require extra CPU cycles. For deletion or for? Keeping track of the live lists in memory. Uh-huh. Um, is, is it negligible or is it noticeable? Um, I haven't tried to, like, study that precisely. I was more focused on, on I.O. Um, I don't think it should be too bad. Clearly, we're not going to need another core dedicated to this, or you would have noticed that already. Yeah, I mean, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> the CPU cost is just appending to those live lists. Yeah. And determining which live lists to append you know, takes O of log n time, where n is the number of sub lists. And that's proportional to the size of the clone. Like Typically, very small. Yeah. Right? Like your example of fifty is probably like, like it, that would be crazy if you yeah. ever had fifty in real life. So, um, you know, the number, the, these numbers, practically speaking, are usually very very small. Um, for kind of 
for it, for kind of casual use where you're using like record size 128K and you're not creating clones that are like multiple, you know, of things that are like terabytes and terabytes, um, you're just not going to notice. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. When you reach the tipping point where you don't need the live things anymore, do you just delete them and not keep them? Or? Uh, we just like delete the metadata. Yeah. 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 So if you, if, yeah, uh, this, this project kind of exposed like interesting assumptions about like what people use clones for. Um, and if you use a clone to just make a few changes and then maybe like, I don't know, snapshot that and do something else, this makes sense. But if you have a clone that basically like is kind of like a file system in its own right and has like completely diverged from where it started and is around for a really long time, um, then this, this algorithm won't work very well. And hopefully, this uh, threshold should have detected it, and it'll just be turned off. Yeah? So can you explain again when the compaction works exactly? So when is this performance will work? Yeah. Um, so basically, every sync, um, or every time, yeah, like every sync you check and see, hey, are there some live lists that, so you can compute whether or not um, a live list can be condensed um, in constant time because we're, we're storing the numbers of Alex and the numbers of freeze as like metadata of the, of the list. And so you, you basically like iterate through your, your list of sublists and, and check them like pairs in order, can these condense? And if so, then you kind of like append that into the on this like work queue, and then um, there's this open context um, called a zether zfs thread that tries and and reads everything into memory, computes like what should be deleted or not, de yeah, what should be deleted, what should remain, um, and then it goes back on the next sync and actually does that. So it, it's happening, like, if it's possible, it'll, it, it basically just does it on demand. Can you, like, when you're comparing those two sublists and seeing if it, they can be condensed, how do you determine, like, if, if that pair of sublists should be condensed into one? Yeah, so you look at the number of uh, Alex in that sublist and the number of freeze, and you know that the freeze will cancel out the number of freeze of Alex because they're guaranteed each to have a buddy in the sublist. And so you just like double the number of frees and subtract that from the total size of the list, and that will tell you the condensed size. Yeah. Are you always only merging adjacent sublists? Yes. Okay, so, and is there some cap of, like, does this algorithm work recursively? So if you have condensed two or merged two sublists into one, would it again check whether they're in the sublist? Do you have any cap on this algorithm, or is it just? Nope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it only does like one merge per sync. Yeah. Um, but like, it it can arbitrarily condense them all down just to one, um, eventually. But it it yeah. It, similar to delete, we want to make sure that uh, we're only really dealing with with one or two sublists per per sync. Um. So yeah, uh, this this has been working well for us. Uh, it's been use, in use at Delphix uh, for a couple months now. Um, we're upstreaming it to OpenZFS and probably porting it over to ZFS on Linux in the near future. Um, so I'll be looking for reviewers, if anyone's interested. Um, just want to quickly shout out um, Saraba, who was intern at Delphix and did some of the preliminary work on this project. Um, Matt, for all his mentorship. And then also uh, Seraphim, one of my coworkers, for helping me practice this presentation like nine times. Uh, so, yeah, thanks.
Um, no. Uh, live lists are a like Z pool feature, and so if it'll it'll start off with one, and then as soon as it notices that you're not sharing very much, it'll it'll turn off. But until then, it's on. Um, that is a major Yeah, they're like metadata, so they have a kind of different deletion path. I mean, Yeah, so right now um, the threshold is if you make it small enough that it would be able, it's like if it's less than half of its size, so that it would be able to merge with another one. So it doesn't delete just separate unless it will be merged. Yeah, exactly. Unless it's, it's small enough that it could potentially be merged with another of the same size. Cool. Uh, other questions? All right, awesome. Um, feel free to come ask me questions in person if you want. Um, otherwise, thank you for coming. <laughs>